Public transit. Public transportation in North America varies greatly from place to place. Some large cities, like New York, Boston, Toronto, and Montreal, have subway systems. These same cities usually also have train service into the city, but most towns and cities do not have subways or trains. Some do not even have buses. Most big cities have some sort of public bus service. In most North American cities, people who use the buses complain about poor service. This is partly because most people prefer to drive a car. Automobile companies spend billions of dollars on advertising. They want to convince young people that they should drive a car as soon as they are old enough. Even when public transportation is very good, most North Americans prefer to drive cars. So mostly students, poor people, and seniors use buses. The large car companies have a lot of economic and political power in North America. They can usually convince politicians to limit the money put into public transit. Lobbying by large car companies has been effective in closing down many railway lines. In some cases, large corporations have bought train tracks and torn them up. So that no one could use them again, because of this, nearly all transportation in North America is by car, bus, or truck. The automobile created the modern North American city. Cars allowed families to live outside the city and drive back into work. Since the 1920s, large numbers of Americans have lived in the suburbs and used cars to do nearly all their daily activities. People drive to school, to work. To the shopping mall, to the theater, to church, and to doctors, lawyers, and dentists. Because the modern city is so spread out, it is difficult to get where you want to go by walking or even by bicycling. But the automobile also causes problems. Car accidents are a major cause of death and injury. Crowded streets and snarled traffic can lead to road rage. Frustrated drivers sometimes get out of their cars to fight each other. Young people often use cars as super toys. They enjoy driving very fast and take risks while driving. A high proportion of serious accidents concern drivers using alcohol or drugs. More recently, some people have accused cell phones of being a cause of accidents. About half of the air pollution in North American cities is caused by motor vehicles. The exhaust fumes from cars and trucks are part of this. The other part is that vehicles erode the surface of the highways. Small particles are torn loose from the road and thrown into the air as cars whiz by. Heavy trucks are particularly large contributors to particle pollution, especially in hot weather. A layer of smog covers many cities. Much of this is caused by motor vehicles. Because city roads are often crowded, the result is frequent traffic jams. When cars are moving very slowly, bumper to bumper, it adds to air pollution. Another problem with cars is that not everyone can afford one. The average car costs nearly twenty thousand dollars to buy and about four thousand dollars a year to operate. So cars are also a status symbol. People with cars tend to move out of the city. As a result, downtown areas are usually where the poorer people live. For a long time, many people have said that governments should try to make downtown areas more attractive to live in. This would include improving public transit into and inside the cities. Then some people may move back from the suburbs, and air pollution levels will decline. Right now, the large automobile companies and oil companies oppose these measures. Recently, there have been cuts to public transit in many cities. Whether these cuts continue or whether they get reversed is a big political issue in North America today. Red-haired Anne. The story of Anne Shirley, the red-headed orphan, has been popular around the world for almost a century. The opening chapters of Anne of Green Gables tell how a brother and sister, living together on a farm, have decided to adopt a boy.
Matthew Cuthbert is now 60 years old and needs help working the farm. They have sent away to the orphanage, and the boy will be arriving by train. When Matthew goes to the train station with his horse and buggy, there is no boy, only a girl, Anne Shirley. Anne is no ordinary girl. She has a vivid imagination and loves to talk about things that interest her. Matthew, who is shy and quiet, takes an immediate liking to her. When they arrive home, however, his sister Marilla is very upset. She doesn't see what good a girl would be to them. Matthew says, "We might be some good to her." After a while, Marilla begins to feel sorry for the thin little orphan and decides to keep her. But Marilla finds that teaching Anne how to behave properly is quite a challenge. Anne often does things without thinking first, and Marilla has to be vigilant to keep her out of trouble. As time goes by, Anne becomes accepted in the community and doesn't get into as many difficulties. One characteristic of the little orphan is a love of big words. While she lived a life of hard work, Anne liked to imagine beautiful things that she didn't have. This was her way of dealing with unhappiness when she worked as a servant for unkind people. Living at Green Gables makes her happy, but she doesn't lose her love of special words or beautiful things. Anne is also unhappy because she has red hair and freckles. In Anne's day, beautiful women were thought to have light, clear complexions and black hair. Her coloring seemed unromantic. However, red hair and freckles are very common on Prince Edward Island, where many of the people are of Scottish descent. This story tells us a lot about how to be happy. When Matthew and Marilla stop worrying about needing a boy and start taking care of Anne, they find that they enjoy having her around. Their lives become much more interesting now that they have someone who needs them. So happiness involves looking after others and being needed by them. There are many stories about orphans when Anne of Green Gables was written. Before modern medicine, many parents died before their children were grown up. A lot of mothers died in childbirth, since fathers didn't usually try to raise young children in those days. Someone else had to take the responsibility. This is what happened to Lucy Maud Montgomery, the author of Anne. Her mother died when she was a baby, and her father left her with her mother's parents. Montgomery's grandparents provided a good home for her, but they were very strict and stern, and didn't have a lot of sympathy with the little girl. In her story, Montgomery is imagining how she would have liked her own life to have happened. What if her grandparents had been more like Matthew and Marilla? What if they had allowed her to do more of the things she wanted to do? Wouldn't she have been happier then? The story shows how young children are hurt by bad treatment from the adults looking after them. Even if the adults don't mean to be unkind, sometimes they say or do things that make children very unhappy. Anne teaches parents and grandparents to encourage their children and help them to be happy and successful. Anne Shirley is one little person who changes a whole community and makes it better. We all have special gifts and talents, and if we are allowed to use those abilities, they will benefit everyone around us. Romance novels. Novels are imaginary stories about people and events. They are written to entertain and amuse. Two thousand years ago, Greek writers told tales of young lovers. Usually, the lovers were separated by terrible events and were reunited only after much hardship and suffering. This plot idea is still in use today. The most popular books for women today in North America are romance novels. Many millions are sold every year. This means that romance publishing is big business and very competitive. Companies survey their readers to determine the kinds of stories they like. One survey asks readers whether or not they would like more references to sex in their novels. Usually, romances are about love, not sex. But in today's market, publishers are ready to give their readers what they want. The essence of the romance is to create suspense by putting obstacles in the way of lovers. One simple obstacle is to make the hero and the heroine as different as possible. For example, an Eastern school teacher meets a Western cowboy. Of course, at first they don't like each other at all, but in time they fall in love. 
or a female social worker might meet an aggressive businessman. Quite often the heroine is a spinster who has sworn never to marry, or perhaps she has a special dislike for the hero and his family. The romance writer must come up with a plausible way to bring the two together. There are a number of popular plots that lead to marriage. Sometimes the heroine, out of a sense of duty, will move in with the hero to help him raise his children. Or she may be a professional nanny who moves in with a widower. A favorite plot is the marriage of convenience. Two people who don't like each other get married for financial or political reasons, or for the sake of the children. Later, of course, they fall in love. In most cases, there is some particular obstacle to marriage. Often, either the hero or the heroine already has children, and he or she doesn't expect that anyone will want to take on their ready-made family. Sometimes, one or the other has a physical disability, or is of a different race, class, or background. For example, the heroine may come from a very strict and proper family, while the hero may have a dubious reputation or even be a criminal. The interest of the story lies in how these very different people come together. Usually, the hero is a very masculine type—a cowboy, engineer, military man, pirate, gambler, etc. The heroine is usually very female, but may have tomboy or spinster traits. She frequently has a strong personality and a temper, and is described as feisty or fiery. A good example of the two types is Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara in *Gone with the Wind*. Nearly every romance novel will contain some promotional offer to encourage readers to order more books. Romances can be addictive, and some women read them almost nonstop. Some romances are very well written, but the majority follows a set formula. That way, the reader always knows what to expect. Shopping at the mall. At one time in North America, most people shopped downtown on Main Street. Most businesses were at the center of town. When people started using automobiles, however, they moved away from downtown. In time, most people lived in the suburbs. Eventually, stores and small shopping plazas were built in suburban areas. Still, most of the big stores were downtown. But as more and more cars were on the roads, driving and parking downtown became a problem. There wasn't room for a lot of cars to park downtown. People also didn't want to fight downtown traffic just to go shopping. So, in the 1950s and 1960s, there was the beginning of large suburban shopping malls and plazas. Plazas were a row of stores attached to one another. Malls were usually a double row of stores with a roof connecting both rows. This means that shoppers did all their shopping inside. Large department stores and grocery stores were usually part of the mall, but there were many smaller stores as well. When you came to the mall and went inside, many people would get a shopping cart. You can walk along the aisles, putting your purchases in the cart. When you're finished shopping, you can push your shopping buggy out to the car. Many malls also have buggies or strollers for pushing small children along. There can be a lot of walking in a trip to the mall. In fact, some people go to the mall just to exercise. A half dozen laps around the mall every morning amount to a pretty good workout. However, there are always places to sit down when you get tired. Most malls have a food court. This is an open area with a lot of tables and chairs. Usually, there are a dozen or more small restaurants circled around the food court. The department stores often have full-size restaurants. Malls have large parking lots. Unlike downtown, you don't pay to park at the mall. On a busy day, finding a space close to the store can be a challenge. Many people go to the malls when the weather is bad. During wintry weather, the malls are busy. Likewise, in really hot summer weather, people go to the malls to get cool. The climate there is always the same. People don't go to malls just to shop. They also go to meet people. Usually, you bump into friends and neighbors there. Old people, as well as teenagers, go there to see friends. Usually, the malls sponsor special events. With lots to see and do, malls are a popular place to hang out. Stephen Foster, American songwriter. Before radio and television, movies and recordings, entertainment was often a family or community matter. Someone in the family could play a musical instrument. Or a neighborhood musician would play for small gatherings. In addition, there would be traveling groups of musicians, actors, and clowns who would go from town to town. In 19th century United States, one of the most popular forms of entertainment was the minstrel show. Black slavery was still permitted in the southern states until 1865. Even after that date, the lives of many blacks working on large farms or plantations did not change much. 
They did hard physical labor in the fields, had little control over their lives, and very little time to relax with their friends. Foster, who was born in 1826, made this situation the background for many of his songs. White musicians would try to imagine the feelings of black men and women working on the plantations. They would write songs in the dialect or speech patterns that they thought black slaves used. In these songs, the black people would be talking about their hardships, falling in love, playing music and dancing, and finally growing old and dying. White performers would blacken their faces and sing these songs to white audiences. They would play musical instruments like the banjo, a small four-string guitar, which black people played often. As a small boy, Stephen Foster had sometimes been taken to a black church by his family's black servant, Olivia Pies. Here, he first heard the melodies that inspired his own songs. Only a couple of Foster's songs are based directly on Negro spirituals, but many of his songs have the natural simplicity and emotional power of folk songs. The youngest member of a large family, Foster showed his musical talent at an early age. He played the flute, violin, and piano. Growing up in an energetic business family, Stephen was expected to become a businessman, and for a while he worked as a bookkeeper. All his spare time, however, was spent writing songs. Foster attended minstrel shows and tried to get the performers to sing his songs. Sometimes the performers would steal his songs and publish them under their own names. Copyright laws were weak and rarely enforced, so some music publishers would just go ahead and publish a song without paying the songwriter. Since Foster hoped to make a living as a songwriter, this was a problem. Foster's first hit song was Oh Susanna, published in 1848. It became popular with the thousands of men from all over the United States who were heading west to the California gold rush of 1849. Unfortunately, as an unknown songwriter, Foster received no money from his early songs. He seems to have given them outright to the music publishers just to establish his reputation. Foster's name, however, was soon widely known, and in 1849 he was able to afford to give up bookkeeping and marry the daughter of a Pittsburgh physician. During the next five years, he earned a moderately good income from songwriting. In 1851, a daughter, Marion, was born. Foster wrote many of his best-known songs at this time, Old Folks at Home in 1851, My Old Kentucky Home in 1853, and Jeannie with a Light Brown Hair in 1854. Difficulties in Foster's marriage began fairly soon. These may have been partly due to his strange work habits. He spent days locked in his room working on his songs. Then he would rush out with his materials to the local music store, presumably to test out the songs on his friends. He also became more and more addicted to alcohol. Eventually, his wife and daughter left him. Foster died alone in a rooming house in 1864. Immigrants to the United States brought their traditional folk songs with them. However, there are very few typically American songs. Foster provided many songs that expressed the life of 19th century USA. His songs were easy to sing and were popular with nearly everyone. In a sense, Foster helped to create roots for American popular music. Sunday Morning at Church Every Sunday is a holiday or half-holiday in North America. Some stores may be open, but banks, offices, and government services are usually closed. Sunday closing has a Christian origin. Christians believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday morning, so Sunday is known as the Lord's Day. About 30 or 35 percent of North Americans attend church regularly on Sunday mornings. About the same percentage attend church occasionally. At Christmas and Easter, the churches are very full as people celebrate these two important holy days. Nearly everybody goes to church at least three times. They are baptized or dedicated as a child. Most people are married in a church, and many people are buried after a church service. Church services are usually held Sunday mornings, often at 11 o'clock a.m., although there may also be evening services provided. Most services last an hour. Their purpose is to worship God and to help people focus on religious and moral beliefs. The service is led by a pastor, minister, or priest, who usually also looks after the people and the business of the church. It is the pastor who delivers the sermon, a 20-minute talk on a religious or moral matter. Usually members take part in the service. They may lead the singing, read from the Bible, offer prayers for the congregation, take up the collection, or act as ushers. Most churches also have a choir, a group of singers who lead in singing the hymns. There are many cultural traditions connected to going to church. 
People normally wear their best clothing and try to be on their best behavior. Talking or making noise in church is usually considered bad. This is why children often have a separate children's church or Sunday school where they can be more like children. The Sunday service is the main weekly event at many churches. But nowadays, there are a growing number of large super churches which organize all kinds of activities for their members. These churches usually have large buildings and a large staff to plan and lead various activities. These might include prayer group, counseling and social work, youth programs, social action, fundraising events, etc. Many large churches have gymnasiums for regular sports activities. At the same time, house churches are also becoming very popular. These are small groups of people who meet at private homes. Sometimes a group will meet in a house until they have the money to buy a church. But many people say they prefer to meet in small groups. That way they get to know one another better. Then they feel comfortable sharing their problems and successes and praying for each other. Some say that large churches can interfere with getting close to God and other Christians. There are many different brands of Christianity. The largest single denomination in North America is Roman Catholicism. One large Christian brands are Episcopalian, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, Lutheran, and Presbyterian. All have slightly different traditions and beliefs. Although in the past these groups have often been in conflict with one another, today they usually cooperate in working together for their members and the community. North America's Rainforest When people think of rainforests, they usually think of the tropical jungle, but heavy rain can also produce dense forests in temperate areas. Along the northwest coast of North America, there are some of the largest trees in the world. This forest runs along the Pacific coast from Alaska down to northern California. About half of it is in British Columbia, Canada. Several species of trees grow to an immense size. Some grow up to 95 meters, 312 feet high, and 12 meters, 40 feet in circumference. They may be as much as 1,000 years old. Because the trees are so tall, the forest has various levels of growth. Small plants attach themselves to the tall trees and may form a kind of garden in the air. Further down are the tops of the younger trees. Closer to the ground are shrubs and bushes. Along the ground are moss, ferns, berries, and other plants. These old forests have developed over several thousand years. The tall trees are at least several hundred years old. This old forest has several special features. Some of the dead tall trees remain standing and become homes for insects, birds, and small animals. Trees that fall to the ground can become nurse logs for new plants or trees to grow on. Trees that fall across rivers and streams can provide natural dams, which provide quiet water for animals to live in. In recent years, it has become common for logging companies to clear cut this old forest. To clear cut a forest means to go into a section of forest with heavy machinery and cut down every tree. Sometimes these clear cuts are as large as some European countries. Logging companies are doing this because it is a cheap method of logging. The problem is that when an old forest is cut, it does not grow back again. Even with replanting, companies produce a tree farm, not an old forest. The complexity of an old forest, which grew over thousands of years, is lost forever. The old forest can shelter many kinds of birds, mammals, fish, and plants that a replanted forest cannot. Another issue is that companies are cutting more and more old forests because they haven't done enough replanting. As long as governments have been willing to let companies cut old forests, neither logging companies nor governments have been much motivated to replant the forests. As a result, most of the old forest has been cut down and continues to be cut at a rapid rate. This situation has also worsened because new technology allows more rapid logging. Clear cut logging results in erosion, which in turn damages the quality of rivers and streams. This causes a decline in the salmon fishery. Animals like grizzly bears, elk, and deer are harmed by the loss of habitat. Likewise, birds that nest in the old forest, such as bald eagles, owls, woodpeckers, and various seabirds, are being threatened. Recently, Public interest in the old rainforests has resulted in an increase in tourism. 
People come to see these spectacular trees and the many plants and animals that depend on them. We hope that these unique temperate rainforests will remain for many more generations to enjoy. Peggy's Cove, Nova Scotia. Why do people travel hundreds of miles to look at beautiful scenery? And why does one particular place attract many more visitors than similar places not far away? Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia, Canada is one of those special spots that draws people from all over the world. It is hard to explain its special charm, but anyone who has been there will know what I am talking about. The southern eastern shore of Nova Scotia possesses many picturesque fishing villages and many beautiful seascapes, but one doesn't have to go very far from the capital city of Halifax to see this special spot. There are no trees around Peggy's Cove. The dominant feature are huge, round granite rocks, many of them the size of houses. They seem to be pushing up and out of the land and sea. Nestled inside the circle of these rocks is a group of fishing huts. Now and then, a fishing boat leaves by the little bay or cove in order to travel out into the great Atlantic Ocean. For nearly two hundred years, there have been fishermen at Peggy's Cove. All around the little harbor, there are huts or fish stores where the fishermen do their work. Here, they bring in the fish and clean them, wash them, and salt them. The salted fish are then stored in barrels. Nowadays, however, more fish are sold fresh than salted. Visiting as a tourist, I wandered into one of these little huts while the fisherman was busy at his work. He explained to me that although Peggy's Cove is a tourist destination, it is also a working fishing village. The fishermen get no money from the tourists, but have to take the time to talk to them and explain their work. There are, however, some tourist shops and tea rooms in the vicinity. Part of the charm of Peggy's Cove is that it is so small. The population has been well under one hundred people for most of its history. The buildings are mostly small dwellings, with the lighthouse being the most prominent structure. A good variety of fish are caught in the area, including mackerel, herring, haddock, cod, and halibut. Lobsters are also trapped nearby. However, because of overfishing, catches have declined in recent decades. The plants and animals of the area are also of interest. Showy purple lupins grow close to the ocean. They thrive on salty ground, and the closer they grow to the spray of the ocean, the better. One of the world's few carnivorous plants, the common pitcher plant, also grows around Peggy's Cove. Its leaves trap insects, which are digested to nourish the plant. Common birds are the stately blue heron, which likes to fish in the marshy pools. The heron stands several feet high and spear fish and frogs with its sharp beak. Another bird is the osprey or fish hawk. The osprey's keen eyes can spot a fish moving beneath the surface of the water. It can dive swiftly, hitting the water with great speed, catch the fish in its claws, and then fly away with its catch. I have also seen pools close to the ocean, full of large tadpoles. These tadpoles spend several years in the water before they develop into bullfrogs. Bullfrogs, the largest Canadian frog, have been known to eat baby ducks and small fish. Looking over the little harbor and out toward the great ocean, one notices the contrast between the very small and the very large. If Peggy's Cove were larger. It would be more ordinary. As it is, it represents all the little fishing villages where men have gone forth in little boats to fish on the wide ocean. Prince Edward Island. Throughout history, people have dreamed about a special place remote from the day-to-day -day business world. Sometimes they have thought of this place as an enchanted world where the weather is always good and the food is always easy to get. Sometimes it has been a hidden valley in the mountains or an island far out to sea. When the Europeans arrived in the South Pacific, they thought that they had found it. Islands such as Tahiti seemed about as perfect as possible. Nowadays, our cities grow larger and larger, and people have to work harder and harder to succeed. Many people would like to escape to a quieter, slower, more peaceful, more attractive environment.
When summer holidays come, many people travel to Prince Edward Island in eastern Canada. It has a mild summer climate and hardly ever gets too hot or dry. The fields, trees, and crops stay green all summer. In fact, PEI is famous for the many shades of green on the island. Its soil and dirt roads are red because of iron oxide in the soil, and visitors are never far away from the blue waters of the Gulf of Saint Lawrence. In late June and early July, the roadsides are covered with large purple flowers called lupins. The vivid colors of PEI help make the province a photographer's paradise. Prince Edward Island is almost 100 miles long and about 20 miles wide. It is small enough that a tourist can see much of the island in a couple of days. But there are enough interesting things to see and do that most people like to stay longer. One of the chief traditional occupations is fishing. At one time, fishing was an important source of food and income for many islanders. Now the fisheries are in decline. Boat owners find it more profitable to take tourists out to fish than to fish themselves. Lobsters and shellfish are still important to the island, which is famous for its lobster suppers. Tourists can visit many picturesque little fishing villages all around the coastline. Farming is also important. PEI is famous for its potatoes, which are exported all over the world. Dairy farming is also common, and local ice cream is popular with tourists. Apple orchards, grain fields, hay fields, and vegetable gardening are also widely found. During the era of sailing ships, a lot of shipbuilding took place on the island. But as steel hulls replaced wooden hulls, shipbuilding moved to regions where steel was being produced. The full impact of the Industrial Revolution has never hit PEI. Farming, fishing, and tourism have remained the chief industries. There are no large cities on the island. So, if young people want to go to the big city, they have to leave PEI. The majority of island people prefer to live in small towns and villages, just as their ancestors did. Since there wasn't much industry on the island, many people did not have a lot of money. As a result, they made do with their old houses, old furniture, and old ways of doing things. This is why visitors to PEI sometimes feel like they are going back in time. Things on the island seem like they are still the way things were in our parents' or grandparents' day. Most of the people who live on the island are descended from British immigrants in the 18th or 19th centuries. The majority of these were from Scotland, and the Scottish heritage remains strong. There are also some Mi'kmaq Indians and some French Canadians or Acadians. The island has generally avoided social and political strife, and this contributes to the peaceful atmosphere. Islanders welcome people from away as tourists. However, some say that to be a true islander, you have to be born on the island. Nonetheless, some tourists have fallen in love with PEI and have gone there to live. A couple of years ago, a bridge was built to connect the island with the mainland. Many opposed this fixed link, saying that it would destroy the special PEI atmosphere. It remains to be seen whether the island will change now that tourists can drive directly onto the rich red soil. Henry Ford. Some inventions are based on simple ideas or principles. Barometers are based on the idea that air has weight and pushes down on objects. A barometer measures this air pressure. Evangelista Terricelli invented barometers in Italy in 1643. Other inventions have taken longer to develop. The automobile has thousands of parts, and it took a long time to make a really useful car. Henry Ford was one of the first people to make a reliable automobile. In 1765, James Watt invented the steam engine. Within a few years, a Frenchman, Nicolas Cugnot, had built a steam-powered vehicle. These steam carriages were used in England in the 1800s, but they were big and slow. They looked like a train without the tracks. Most people preferred to travel by train. In Germany during the 1870s and 1880s, Nikolaus Otto and Gottlieb Daimler developed the internal combustion engine. This ran by burning gasoline. Another German, Karl Benz, built a gasoline-powered car. 
Around the world, there were many inventors trying to build a car that would be better than the one before. Some people thought that electric cars would become common. In the 1890s, several inventors working in the United States developed a gasoline-powered car that was practical for daily use. Henry Ford was born on a farm in Michigan in 1863. As a boy, he loved to take clocks and watches apart and reassemble them. Eventually, he went to work for the Detroit Edison Company. In his spare time, he worked on a horseless carriage, as the early cars were called. In 1896, he completed a car that ran smoothly. He later sold it and made another one. Since early cars were made by hand, they were usually quite expensive. Not only that, but when they broke down, there were no repair shops to take them to. One had to know how to repair a car oneself. Henry Ford tried to make cars which would be affordable and which would not break down very easily. His Ford Motor Company was formed in 1903 in Detroit, Michigan. Since many parts had to be brought together to make a car, Ford developed the assembly line. On the line, each worker would do one specific job. When the car reached the end of the assembly line, it was finished. In this way, many cars could be made in a single day. The result was that Ford was able to bring the price of cars down. Ford's Model T car was advertised as being as frisky as a jackrabbit and more durable than a mule. Since it cost hundreds rather than thousands of dollars, many ordinary families were now able to buy a car. Once many people had cars, their habits began to change. People didn't have to live next to the factories or offices that they worked in. Going for Sunday drives or traveling to tourist sites became a common thing. In 1905, a car drove across the United States and back again. In 1912, a car went across Canada from coast to coast. Soon there was public pressure for good roads so that cars could travel anywhere in North America. Henry Ford was not the only inventor of the modern car. However, he was able to make a car that everyone could use and afford. It could be a whole lot better. As I was sitting in the reading room at the library, a man got up and left, commenting, "It could be a whole lot better." I wasn't sure whether he was referring to the reading room, the world he was reading about, or something else. I replied without thinking, "That's always true and always false." What I meant was that it was always possible to make little changes to improve things, but it isn't clear ahead of time that these changes will make a big overall improvement in a library, in the world, or in anything else. Years ago, literary critics used to examine great writers very closely to find bad phrasing or ungrammatical sentences. They'd look at a play by Shakespeare and identify lines that they didn't think were very good. Sometimes they would suggest that these lines were added by another writer, or that Shakespeare had written this part quickly without much consideration. Sometimes they would omit or improve on the lines. It is doubtful that any of Shakespeare's plays were actually improved by these critics. An entire play needs high points and low points, poetry and prose. The whole thing is greater than its individual parts, and changing a couple of these parts may not improve the whole thing. It is the same in many other areas: music, athletics, scholarship, and probably everyday living. It's not always the singer or musician who is flawless that we admire most. Sometimes it is the person whose performance is not perfect, but who puts a special energy, feeling, or enthusiasm into their work that we admire. It is true that little things can sometimes add up to a big difference. Changing a bad habit can make a difference in your life and in the lives of the people around you. Giving up smoking, for example, or ceasing to criticize a family member, can make an important difference. Sometimes, however, we are only looking at the symptoms of a larger problem. For example, nearly everyone would agree that giving up smoking is a good idea. But if our smoking is related to emotional problems or stress in our lives, then giving up smoking may make us feel even worse. It may be necessary to deal with the root problem. It can happen too that being always on the lookout for ways to improve things may become a problem in itself. Perfectionism means never being satisfied with things as they are. 
especially if we're always criticizing people around us for not being good enough. This can become a bad thing. A popular saying in North America is, "If it ain't broke, don't fix it." This is a warning to people who feel that their role or position involves making continuous changes in policies, procedures, products, or personnel. Sometimes the drive for change can be more of a personality problem than a genuine concern to make things better. Real problems are often clearly apparent. Problems like world hunger, personality conflicts. Policies that don't work, poor levels of service, bad manners, and all kinds of troubles are hard to ignore. They are also difficult to resolve. Perhaps that's one reason why some people identify things as problems, which are of concern to hardly anyone except themselves. Yes, we can make the world and the reading room better, but we can also make them worse. It takes a lot of discernment and usually some experience to know how to make a particular thing better. There are so many things that could use improvement that it is difficult to know where to start. This too requires some thought, not to mention prayer and study. We can start by asking whether the thing we see as a problem is also a problem for other people. If it isn't, then maybe our energy and attention might be better employed elsewhere. John Chapman. American pioneer. When the first Europeans came to North America, they found dense forests coming down right to the shore. So thick were the forests that it was said that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River without once touching the ground. Clearing these trees to make room for fields and buildings was a very difficult task for the early settlers. Another difficulty was finding enough food in this new land. Many European crops could not grow in this climate. Carrying and storing seeds over a long period was also risky. Native Indians were often helpful in teaching the settlers how to find food, but sometimes there were no Indians nearby, or they were hostile. John Chapman is famous today because he helped the early settlers grow one important product: apples. Apples could be eaten fresh in the fall or stored through the winter. They could be made into fresh apple juice or alcoholic cider. They could be dried or made into applesauce. Apples also could be made into vinegar, which is very useful for keeping vegetables from spoiling. John Chapman was born in Massachusetts in 1774, the year before the American Revolution began. John's father joined George Washington's army to fight for American independence from Great Britain. While the war was going on, John's mother died. In 1870, John's father married again, and soon John had lots of younger brothers and sisters. John probably worked on his father's farm as he was growing up. Then he worked on neighboring farms. It may be at this time that John began to learn about apples. After the Revolutionary War, the population of the USA was expanding. Many Americans wanted to go west over the mountains to find land in Indian territory. In the fall of 1797, young John Chapman headed west to Pennsylvania. On his way, he gathered leftover apple seeds from the cider mills that he passed. As usual, John walked barefoot, but as he traveled, snow began to fall. He tore strips off his coat and tied them around his feet. Then he made snowshoes out of tree branches. When he arrived in the west, he began to clear land and plant apple seeds. This began a pattern that would last Chapman's whole life. He would travel ahead of the settlers, clear land, and then sell his baby apple trees to the settlers when they arrived. When the area became too settled, Chapman would move further west and start again. Many settlers regarded John Chapman as a strange character. He never bought new clothes, but wore whatever old clothes came his way. But he was always welcome at a settler's cabin. John was good at clearing land, telling stories, and growing apples. He liked children, and children liked him. He was a religious man and would read to the settlers about God and living together peacefully. At this time, there was conflict between the settlers and Indians about land. John managed to be friendly with both groups, but John did warn the settlers if the Indians were planning to attack them. Every fall, John went east to gather more apple seeds. He would then go farther west and find some empty land to plant his seeds. During the warm weather, he tended all his fields of baby apple trees. 
Once they were properly grown, he sold the seedlings to settlers. When he had earned enough money, he bought land to grow more apple trees. In his own lifetime, he became known as Johnny Appleseed. Legends grew up about him. It was said that his bare feet could melt snow and that he could leap across rivers. Johnny Appleseed never built himself a real home. He was a wanderer all his life, traveling west to Indiana and Iowa and back east again. He enjoyed sleeping outdoors, lying on his back, looking up at the stars, and thinking about God and His world. He died in Indiana in 1845, and no one knows exactly where he's buried. But all through that region are hundreds of apple trees. These apple trees are the most fitting memorial to John Chapman, the legendary Johnny Appleseed. Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada is a large state of deserts and mountains. Since most of the land is not suitable for farming, the population grew very slowly. In the 1950s, there were only 267,000 people in the entire state. Now there are nearly a million people living in the Las Vegas area alone. Las Vegas has become a major tourist center. It used to be quite a little desert town of the old west, but in the 1950s and 1960s, hotels and gambling casinos were opened. In order to bring tourists to town, these hotels hired well-known entertainers. Soon, Las Vegas became known as a major entertainment center. In order to promote the growth of Nevada, some activities were allowed which were against the law in other states. These included gambling and prostitution. It was also easier to get married in Nevada than in some other states. Over time, many other attractions were developed. Much of the activity in Las Vegas goes on at some 30 major hotels. Many of these hotels provide a complete range of services and entertainment. Some of them boast 4,000 or 5,000 rooms. It is common for these large hotels to be organized around a particular theme, such as the Middle Ages, the Arabian Nights, the movies, the circus, Paris, Egypt, or the Far East. The hotel, its restaurants, shops, lounges, and entertainment reflect this theme. For example, the Paris Las Vegas Hotel has a 50-story replica of the Eiffel Tower. The Luxor Hotel has a huge image of an Egyptian sphinx and a replica of the tomb of King Tut. Nearly all of the major hotels also contain a casino, sometimes several casinos. Gambling is a major reason why people come to Las Vegas. There are slot machines, blackjack tables, and roulette wheels, and much more. Even though Las Vegas is in the desert, there is an extravagant use of water. Large swimming pools, water slides, artificial waterfalls, and huge fountains are common. Health spas, beauty salons, fashion boutiques, specialty restaurants, and malls abound. Tennis and golf are also popular. The lavish shows at Las Vegas are world famous. Tall dancing showgirls, like the famous Rockettes, wear beautiful but rather skimpy costumes. Some entertainers, like singer Wayne Newton, rarely leave Las Vegas. The pay there is good, and the audiences are appreciative. Near Las Vegas are other tourist sites, such as the giant Hoover Dam. Behind the Hoover Dam is the large artificial lake. Lake Mead. Further up the river is the Grand Canyon. All these things are a short trip from the city. Las Vegas is called the city that never sleeps. At nearly any time of the day or night, there are casinos and shows that are open. A monorail connects many of the leading hotels. Many people view Las Vegas as a total entertainment package. One word of caution: set yourself a limit on how much you will spend at the casinos. Gambling. Can be a dick. Laura Secord. Women have often played an important role in war. They have worked in munitions factories, made clothing and supplies, encouraged and entertained soldiers, nursed the wounded, and acted as spies. It is rare, however, for a woman to have played a key role in determining the course of a war. Many people believe that Laura Secord played such a role in the War of 1812. 
Laura Secord was born in the United States at the time of the American Revolution. Her father had fought in the U.S. Army against the British, but when land in the American states became scarce, the family moved to Ontario, Canada, and so back under British rule. Laura married into a pro-British family and adopted their political views. So when the War of 1812 broke out between Britain and America, her husband James Secord. Joined the Canadian militia to defend Ontario against the Americans. The American invasion of 1812 was defeated at Queenston Heights, and some of the wounded were brought to Laura's house in nearby Queenston. Laura went out to the battlefield where she found her husband James, who was severely wounded, and brought him home. In 1813, the U.S. invasion was more successful. Parts of Ontario close to the U.S. border were occupied by American troops. Local families were expected to provide room and board for U.S. officers. It was sometimes possible, therefore, for Canadians to overhear American officers discussing military strategy, either in their homes. Or in the local tavern, the situation in Ontario looked desperate. In the spring of 1813, the whole province seemed likely to fall into American hands. In June, Laura overheard talk of an American attack on the British outpost at Beaver Dams. Her husband was still suffering from war injuries, and she had to look after him and their children. Nevertheless, she resolved to go to warn the. British commander. Possibly, Laura did not intend to walk the whole way herself. She hoped to be able to pass on the news to someone else along the way. First, she would have to make up a story to get past the American sentries. She left Queenston in early morning and walked 19 miles to the neighborhood of Beaver Dams by nightfall. She still had to cross a wide stream and climb up the Niagara Escarpment. There, she came upon an encampment of Indians who were assisting the British. Their war cries in the moonlight terrified her, but she insisted on being taken to the British commander. Finally, one of the chiefs escorted her to British headquarters, and she was able to tell Fitzgibbon the American plan of attack. When the Americans arrived in the neighborhood of Beaver Dams, the Indians had prepared an ambush for them. A running fight ensued between the American force of 570 soldiers and 450 Indians supporting the British. At this point, Fitzgibbon arrived with 50 British regulars. Seeing the Americans disorganized and surrounded by the Indians, Fitzgibbon boldly demanded their surrender. By telling the American commander Boatsler that he was facing huge British and Indian forces, Fitzgibbon induced the American leader to turn over his whole army to the British. Although only small armies were involved at Beaver Dams, the battle had great significance. Afterwards, the Americans stayed behind their walls for the rest of the year. The U.S. government recalled their commander in chief. British and Canadian morale increased, and Laura's home in Queenston was restored to British control. Laura Secord's story was little known until 1860. She was an old woman in her eighties when she was presented to the visiting Prince of Wales, later King Edward the Seventh. He awarded a gift of money for her services. Her story then became famous. Today, her home in Queenston, Ontario, is an historical museum and a popular tourist attraction. Little House on the Prairie. Much of the history of North America is about how Europeans moved westward from the Atlantic coast towards the Pacific. The first settlements began around 1600, and it was a long time before the Europeans settled the interior. By the late 18th century, however, good farmland along the east coast was becoming scarce. As the population increased, people began thinking about all the native Indian lands further inland. Families were quite large in pioneer days, and the oldest son usually inherited the family farm. 
This meant that other sons and daughters would have to move away when their parents died. Often the sons would want to begin their own farm and start their own family. But if there was no farmland available, or if it was too expensive to buy, they were out of luck. One option was to move west, where land was free or very cheap. Sometimes the whole family might move if their old farm was no longer productive. Sometimes the old farm was on poor soil, or too much farming had exhausted the soil. Perhaps better land could be had further west. There were other reasons for moving west. Pioneer settlers depended on wild birds, fish, and wild animals for food, furs, and skins for clothing and trading, and trees for building materials. These things had become scarce in old settled areas. Out west, there were lots of animals to hunt for food, and animal skins could be traded for supplies. It seemed that it was easier to make a living on the frontier. Of course, there were some problems regarding moving west. Various American Indian tribes who might fight to defend their land occupied the land. Then the land needed to be cleared of trees and stumps before it could be planted. A log cabin and other buildings had to be built. A well had to be dug, or a spring of water found. Settlers might also suffer because there were no doctors or teachers or stores available. These things, though, often did follow closely behind the first settlers. A series of little house books, written by Laura Ingalls Wilder, tells the story of her pioneer family. The Ingalls family moved many times while Laura was a little girl. She was born in Wisconsin in 1867. Her family moved next year to Missouri. Then they moved to Kansas in 1869. The Ingalls moved back to Wisconsin in 1871. They moved to Minnesota in 1874. Her family went to Iowa in 1876. Then back to Minnesota in 1877. Finally, they moved to Desmit, South Dakota, in 1879, and there the family remained. All these moves were typical for a pioneer family, always on the lookout for better land and other opportunities. But all these moves involved very hard work, all of which seemed all lost when the family had to move again. For example, when Laura's parents moved to the Kansas Prairie in 1869, they had many hardships. The family put all their belongings in a covered wagon, which measured four feet by ten feet. Two horses pulled it, and the family dog followed along. Laura and her sister Mary were very little girls. The family and their wagon were nearly washed away trying to cross a small river. They traveled through wild, tall grass where there were no roads. Laura's father built a house on the open prairie with logs he had hauled from the creek bottoms. One of the nearby settlers helped him. They also built a log stable for the horses. That was a good thing because the next night their little house was surrounded by a pack of fifty large wolves. They formed a large circle around the house and howled all night. One day, while Laura's father was away, two Indians visited the house. They wanted Laura's mother to feed them and stood silent while the food was cooking. The Indians wore only fresh skunk skins as clothing. After the Indians had eaten all the food, they left. The following spring, there was a large gathering of Indian tribes. Most of them wanted to fight the settlers. For many nights, the sounds of Indian drums frightened the settlers. One tribe opposed the plan, and finally the gathering broke up, and the Indians went away. Many other problems faced the Ingalls family. These included bad weather. Prairie grass fires and malaria. The worst part was having to leave their new homes. The government decided that Laura's family was living on Indian land and would have to move. So the covered wagon was packed again, and the family traveled north. Such experiences were not unusual for pioneers in the 19th century. Mutiny. Mutiny is a word that has brought fear to the most powerful empires in the world. 
Mutiny is when soldiers and sailors refuse to obey their commanders, often killing or imprisoning them. Mutiny can spread through whole armies and navies, throwing governments into crisis. No wonder that nations have always taken harsh measures to punish mutinous leaders. The ancient Romans executed every tenth man from an army unit that had mutinied. In the British Navy, mutineers were normally hanged. However, one of history's most famous mutinies did not happen to a whole army or navy. It happened on a single small ship, the HMS Bounty. HMS Bounty set sail from England in December 1787. It was a small, cramped vessel, uncomfortable during a long voyage. Its goal was to sail to the South Pacific and bring back Tahitian breadfruit plants. The government hoped that breadfruit would provide a cheap food for black slaves in the British West Indies. The captain of the Bounty. Was William Bligh, a veteran of many voyages. His crew, however, was largely made up of inexperienced young men. There was no room on the ship for soldiers or marines, so Bligh, as the only commissioned officer, had the difficult task of maintaining order. After a long and difficult trip, the bounty finally arrived in Tahiti in October 1788. Free from the constraints of life aboard ship, the young men enjoyed life on the tropical island with the friendly natives. Many of the sailors established relationships with island women. Meanwhile, the collection of breadfruit plants for the homeward voyage continued. In April 1789, Captain Bligh decided that it was time to return to England. The breadfruit plants were loaded on the deck, making the ship cramped indeed. The bounty set sail and would no doubt have reached England again, except for the turmoil in the mind of one of its young officers. Fletcher Christian was 24 years old, of dark complexion, and from a good family. As the bounty pulled further from Tahiti, Fletcher seemed to have decided that he didn't want to return to England. Tahiti had been an earthly paradise, and now long months of discomfort aboard ship awaited him. He was too far from Tahiti to return by himself. He would need the bounty. On April twenty eighth, seventeen eighty nine, some of Fletcher Christian's friends seized control of the ship. Captain Bligh and eighteen sailors who supported him were put in a small open boat with limited food and water. Meanwhile, Christian and his twenty four followers sailed back to Tahiti. Eventually, Fletcher Christian would sail the bounty to the uninhabited Pitcairn Islands, far to the south of the shipping lanes. Meanwhile, Bly and his loyal followers sailed in their open boat almost the width of the Pacific Ocean. They suffered from thirst, hunger, and sickness, as well as hostile natives. Finally, they reached Timor in Indonesia in June and eventually made their way to the capital, Batavia. When they returned to England, Captain Bly was first greeted as a hero. Soon, however, public attitudes changed. The legend began that Bly was a cruel tyrant who had caused the mutiny by harsh treatment of his men. Although Bly had a temper and was not very tactful, this does not appear to be the whole story. In fact, it is the controversy over who is to blame for the mutiny: Bly or Christian. That has kept the story alive for more than two hundred years.